Welcome to the Introduction to Systemic Racism by Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training. First, just a couple of words about who Crossroads is. Um, Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training works to dismantle systemic racism by working specifically inside of institutions. Uh, we believe that institutions were created to um, create, manage, and distribute the resources of society, and because racism uh, creates inequities in the distribution of resources in society, our belief is that an uh, important place to work to dismantle racism is from inside of institutions. The work of Crossroads is based on um, some guiding principles. Um, first of all, our work is based on a systemic analysis of racism um, that looks at uh, individual, institutional, and cultural manifestations. In, um, in our workshops, we have tried to create ways to communicate this analysis of racism in unique ways. The analysis is not unique to Crossroads, but we think we have discovered <clears throat> some interesting ways um, and helpful ways to disseminate the analysis. We strive to be accountable to communities of color. We think it's important that we listen to and are responsible to the communities who are most impacted by the negative effects of racism. We understand that racism is just one of, um, of many different components to global and nationwide movements for racial justice in the United States. We think it's, an, it's important to have a diversity of ways to understand and deal with racism in our country. And we're, Crossroads is proud to be part of a, of a larger movement for justice in the United States. We also understand that racism is just one form of social, uh, social inequality and oppression in the United States and that it's important if we're going to effectively dismantle racism, we need to be aware of and working on those other social inequalities as well. One of the things that we know, though, about racism is that it occupies a very particular um, place in the law and the social structure of the United States, and that oftentimes, historically, other movements for social justice have been divided by racism. The women's movement, for example, is a, is a good example that from very early on, the women's movement was very much focused on the rights of white women at the detriment to the rights of and needs of women of color. Why does Crossroads work to dismantle racism? Because racism dehumanizes all of us and dismantling racism will heal all of us. That we understand that um, as a system of, imp of oppression, Everyone within the system is trapped by the system and is um, negatively impacted and dehumanized by that system of oppression. So our, the anti-racism that Crossroads, the anti-racism work that Crossroads does, we do understanding that it, it, this is a journey to restore all of our humanity. Just a couple words about who I am. Um, uh, my name again is Rebette Diaz, and I'm um, the executive co-director of Crossroads. I'm also a Native American of Karuk descent, and my people's homeland is the northwest corner of California, near the Oregon border along the Klamath and Salmon Rivers. Um, I was, I am a, I grew up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and was very early on inspired by the activism of the '60s particularly of American Indian people and the American Indian movement and, um, and other people of color movements during the civil rights struggles. Um, the occupation of Alcatraz, it was particularly inspiring to me as a young person. Um, the doing anti-racism work in healthcare settings is of particular interest to me. I believe that both of my parents died because of healthcare disparities, my mom in particular. Um, I think looking back on her um, her lingering struggle with cancer and uh, ultimately her death with cancer at age 40 um, has a lot to do with some race-based health disparities. Um, and also as a young person when I became a mom, I chose to uh, do use alternative birth practices. I had my kids at home with a midwife. And so, um, and that's because the, the way that birth is done in hospitals and 
in a very impersonal and mechanized kind of way didn't feel culturally appropriate to me or particularly life-giving for me and my kids. And so um, I also ended up training to be a doula and eventually went to UC Davis uh, to study pre-med because I was going to become a certified nurse midwife. And along the way of that journey, I encountered uh, anti-racism organizing and, um, and that eventually led me to Crossroads in 2002. So I have some goals for the, uh, these, this couple of sessions here. This first session, I really just want to introduce us to some of the concepts of anti-racism, um, create sort of a, um, a why do we need to deal with this uh, scenario. And then in our second session, we'll talk more about, um, about dismantling. Um, I, these sessions really assume that you're not a beginner in this journey. Pretty much anybody who has lived in the United States for any length of time is aware of racial disparities and, um, and the injustice of racism. But that's not to say that we understand it entirely. And so I want to just uh, spend a little bit of time unpacking some of the concepts and the language of, um, of anti-racism. So um, I want for uh, uh, us to we'll start some of the things that we'll look at are how racism shapes individual attitudes and actions in very particular ways that are, um, that are unavoidable in our society. So we say that people, are, um, people in the United States are socialized into, a, uh, into systemic racism. We want to un begin to uh, understand how uh, racism is embedded in the institutional norms of the institutions of our society and how that creates barriers to full inclusion. And we also want to begin to look at how institutional monoculture makes it really difficult for people of color um, in particular and immigrants and refugees as well to access and receive um, resources of our society in culturally sensitive and appropriate ways, and also to become professionals in the variety of institutions provided by our um, society. Now, why is the Center for Public Health Practice a great place to begin unpacking uh, racism and to deal with racism in healthcare? And I think that there's a couple of things about the mission of the um, Center for public health practice that are particularly compelling. And that is the, the commitment to inclusion and to, um, and to continuing education for practitioners and professionals, but then also the commitment to dignity and human rights and, um, and social justice makes this a perfect setting in which to deal with issues like racism. The other thing is that um, I, this quote from, um, from the PBS series, Unnatural Causes, that inequity is making us sick. And there's some compelling information that's given in the Unnatural Causes video series about how the United States, even though we are the wealthiest, um, the wealthiest country in the world, and we spend the most on healthcare, we probably spend half of all of the healthcare dollars that are spent in the entire world are spent here in the United States. And yet we rank 30th in terms of, of health and, um, and wellness. And we rank dead last in, um, in the lineup with all the industrial countries. And so there's something um, about the way that our society is structured that that with inequity structured into it, that makes all of us sick, even those of us who are not victims of social oppression, um, all of our wellness is impaired because inequities in our system exist. I think that's a pretty compelling reason for looking at racism and dealing with racism in healthcare institutions. So first I wanna um, spend a little bit of time thinking, his, thinking about history and how history impacts our lives today. Uh, racism has been with the United States since its beginning, and enormous, uh, enormous progress was made in the 50s and the 60s in terms of ending racial segregation in this country. And yet, 
the legacy of racism is still very much with us. So I'd like to have you reflect briefly on a couple of questions about race relations in the United States. Um, during the 1950s and 60s, amazing progress was made in terms of race relations through the work of the civil rights movement and other people of color movements for justice. And so we're not in the same place we were back then, but we still have a ways to go. So first of all, think for a moment about in terms of race relations in the United States, what has gotten better since the 1950s and 60s and what has gotten worse? And now I'd like to share with you a little video that Crossroads has made that begins to explore some of the, these two questions and also introduces a definition of racism, the definition of racism that we use at Crossroads that we build all of our anti-racism workshops around and which helps us get a grip on, um, on dismantling racism in institutions. So I'm wondering, what do you think about uh, when you hear people talk about America's race problem? I don't see race as really being a, a factor. There's a lot of racial issues that have come up where it shouldn't have come up, but it's America. It's always been that way and it always will be that way. And I think there's a lot of people that is prejudiced. We have uh, all experience uh, some discrimination in our lives. We are living in an area uh, populated by, you know, uh, um, like the inner city, and they're attacked a lot, and, they're, and, and their wives are raped or, or, or mutilated or they've gotten killed. I've experienced racism in ways that are so subtle now and so well disguised, but so much more hateful. I feel that because uh, they wanted equal rights, but to me, through this 30 years, it's gimme, gimme, gimme. I don't think much has changed. I think the problem may be that we focus too much on race, yeah. The discrimination is kind of shifting the other way, where the typical white male is now also getting discriminated and not getting the jobs. We are still in a racist state. Racism, it's part of the fabric of our society. It's been with us since the beginning, when Columbus landed on American shores and still continues to this day. People of color in our country, Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, Arab Americans, and Pacific Islanders have all struggled to be fully accepted as equal citizens but their goal of equality remains unrealized. Racism is still very much with us today, but there is also a positive side to the story of race relations in the United States. Many good and courageous people have struggled to end racism and to change conditions of racial injustice. Countless thousands of people of color and white people have dedicated their lives even died for the sake of racial equality. Because of their efforts, there have been dramatic changes for the better. Yet, in spite of these changes made in recent decades, we need to ask, how much has really changed? Why can't we make racism go away? Why can't we all get along? Recently, we address these questions to a panel of six individuals who are active in efforts to understand and dismantle racism. They are the Reverend William Wong, a leader of the Asian community in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America from Chicago. Barbara Major, a community organizer and anti-racism trainer from New Orleans. Louise Derman Sparks, an early childhood anti-bias educator from Pasadena, California. Dr. Victor M. Rodriguez, who teaches sociology at a private liberal arts college from Irvine, California. James Addington, an anti-racism trainer and organizer from St. Paul, Minnesota. 
Juanita Helfrey, a Native American from the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota, working for the United Church of Christ. During the next 30 minutes, we want to explore the issue of racism. We believe racism continues to be one of the most serious problems of our society. We also believe this is a time of exciting opportunities to work for change. In your own community, your church, your school, the place where you work. Join us in the search for new understanding and new opportunities to work toward a racism-free 21st century. We asked our panel to respond to two questions. First, in what ways are conditions better today than they were in the 1960s? And second, in what ways are conditions worse today than they were in the 1960s? Let's listen to some of the panel's answers to the first question. Well, I think one good thing mm -hmm. is that there are more people of color elected as political um, officers, and so that allows some entry into the political system. Mm -hmm. I think another thing would be uh, greater diversity in the workforce. Uh, affirmative action, I think, mm -hmm. has contributed positively yeah. to mm -hmm. uh, more yes. African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, and Native Americans mm -hmm. being part of the system. For 20 years, the self-determination um, has helped improve conditions on reservations and helped more uh, Native American people get, get jobs in their own communities and get them educated to become teachers and social workers and so on. When I think about something that's better, I think about laws for open housing and, and accommodation. Certainly within many portions of the religious community, it's, it's now common to hear statements on inclusivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a common popular theme. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be in better, another condi improved condition is that there is a lot more material available now. Yes, and certainly cross-cultural relationships are more common now than exactly. they were in the past. And for example, now there is a relatively larger middle class among um, obviously Asians and blacks and Latinos. At least there's discussion now uh, in yes. institutions mm -hmm. around multiculturalism mm -hmm. and diversity. Mm -hmm. Groups like ours can even sit down mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. and openly right. have yeah. discussions mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. racism mm -hmm. in a much deeper sense with a much deeper analysis than we've been able to do before historically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's listen to some of the panel's responses to the second question. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to think of better without thinking of that they each right. I want to qualify each, one, each of the better. So it's like when we talk about right. that, the, I agree that there is more awareness of the need for multiculturalism in schools, but on the other hand, most of it is done in a very superficial way. But at the same time, as I've seen uh, African Americans now, uh, because of the Voting Rights Act, become mayors of city, I've seen federal retrenchment on financial support for every major city in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. In some sense, that, that is part of the bad thing that has happened, is that poverty among uh, Latinos and blacks, which are the statistics that I'm more familiar with, has not changed since the 1940. And the gap between blacks, mm -hmm. whites, and Latinos is, is almost the same. It's almost twice the mm -hmm. difference. And uh, that is devastating because, um, as I stated before, we still had high unemployment, mm -hmm. um, 60 to 80 percent on, on some reservations. I think that another way that things are getting worse is an increased acceptance by, you know, um, Congress or dominant or culture thinking or the media that it's all right for very large numbers of people to be permanently unemployed. Yeah. But I, I think one of the contradictory things mm. about the, the changing demographic diversity is that it creates fear yeah. mm -hmm. in yeah. whites yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because they feel that they will lose power, that they will become mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. quote-unquote a minority. The, the rise in white mm -hmm. supremacist groups uh, or, or the mil, mil, what, state Rich. militias, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, it, it all is feeding into to, to a rise in racially motivated uh, hate mm -hmm. crimes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In some sense, that's related to the fact that now even white supremacist language mm -hmm. is becoming, you know, an accepted part of the mainstream political mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or they can take apart laws like yeah. they're doing with uh, regards to the um, Native American Indian Religious Act, it was known as. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that today racism is becoming more globalized. Mm -hmm. Which also says, you know, something about the deepening of mm -hmm. racism yes. in terms of, you know, the structures of our society, mm -hmm. in terms Absolutely. of the, 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 the culture of our society, the, mm -hmm. the way things operate. 
Looking at this list of ways conditions have gotten better, we can see that we have come a long way on the path toward ending racism. One of the most important achievements in the 1960s was the dismantling of legal segregation. Only a few decades ago, the American system of laws mandated and supported a completely segregated society. We dare not forget the tremendous sacrifices of many courageous people who marched and prayed and even died during the Civil Rights Movement to make these changes happen. Looking at this list of the ways conditions have become worse, we see that we still have a very long way to go. Racism did not end by changing the law. Instead, racism took on new forms beyond the law that are more hidden, more subtle, more sophisticated, and more difficult to eradicate. Racism is more harmful than ever to people of color in our country. For example, Recent studies show that one out of every three African-American men in their 20s are in jail or otherwise caught up in the criminal justice system. Unemployment rates for Latinos are 50% greater than whites, regardless of the level of education. 30.9% of Native Americans live below the poverty level. Another recent study reveals the 35% increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans. The solution to the problem of racism depends on how we define it. How do you define racism? Racism is hate and um, fear. Bigotry, uh, intolerance. It's kind of a hard word to define. Ignorance, lack of education. Unfair discrimination. Is demeaning, is, is unhuman. Prejudice. When we use the word racism, we need a common definition. More often than not, when we talk about racism in our society, on TV or radio, in newspapers, it is described as an individual issue, a matter of personal attitudes and actions. Especially in the white community, we tend to name someone as racist if they are perceived as racially prejudiced, biased, or bigoted in their attitudes or actions. We use the same approach to talk about solutions, about how to end racism. Our solution is simply to change individual attitudes or actions, to reduce or eliminate race prejudice. As white people, we want to feel good about ourselves, and we want people of color to feel good about us as well. But individual attitudes and actions are only a small part of racism. If we want to get to the root of the problem of racism, we need to probe deeper than the issue of race prejudice. We need to look at the ways racism expresses itself through systems and institutions. Corporate racism. I really think it's just society itself. It's obvious, it's a problem with the structures, you know, it's not the individual problem. The, the, the total system. It's a part of the fabric of the society, unfortunately. When our institutions were formed, people were racist. They designed them to meet their own needs. When we, people of color, speak about racism, we mostly describe the power of systems and institutions on our lives. Schools, banks, police, government, businesses, churches. Of course, we may also speak of white individuals as racist. But the power to hurt and control us does not come so much from individuals as from the power of the systems and institutions of our society. We need a definition of racism that goes beyond personal prejudice and focuses on the power of systems and institutions over people of color. A definition we would like you to try goes like this. Race prejudice plus power the power of systems and institutions equals racism. What this definition says is that race prejudice is not the same thing as racism. To one degree or another, everyone is racially prejudiced, no matter what their racial identity. But not everyone's race prejudice is backed up by the power of society's systems and institutions. Race prejudice is turned into racism 
when one group's racial prejudices are enforced by the systems and institutions of a society, resulting in greater rewards and privileges for the racial group with power, and fewer rewards and privileges for the group without power. Let's join our panel as they talk about this definition. One of the things when you look at that definition and you, you, speak, you talk about the word power, and one of the things I, I find is that people get oftentimes caught up in individual power. Mm -hmm. and, and white people particularly, it's very difficult for them to think of themselves as, as part of a, a, a group or a collective. I have white friends. And, and these are people that I respect, I work with, and, and, and they would say, well, I don't want to be a racist. Uh, it's just not in my nature. I, I, I've tried to treat people of color fairly. I have, you know, I have African American friends or I have Asian friends. And, and by looking at this particular definition, it helps me to understand that, wait a minute, even though you're white, you're, 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 this power has power over you. And I often yeah. think that we, we, that we learn to participate in racism before we had a chance to be asked mm -hmm. if we wanted to or not. That yeah. with the research that we have about how early young children mm -hmm. begin to become socialized into racism, it happens really about the second year of life. Mm -hmm. And no one asks us as right. individuals we would like to be racist or not. We all learn it. The negative stereotypes start when we're little. And, and I, you know, can't deny when I was a child that I had perceptions about black people <laughs> that were given to me by my parents or by people in my community or by even <coughs> history books and school books. I think one thing helpful about this of definition is that one thing that you hear very often is, but I've seen people of color who are racially prejudiced. And that's absolutely correct, because we are all racially prejudiced. In fact, you can't be an American, unfortunately, mm -hmm. without having some prejudice mm -hmm. about another group. It's part of the culture, it's part of the history of being who we are. But I think the difference is when we put racial prejudice together with power. That leads to even, a, for me, a great understanding of power is that when, when some folk have the power to affirm the humanity of themselves and not to affirm the humanity of the rest of us. And, and, that's, and that every institution does that. The systemic power of a society is expressed through its institutions, including its culture. We think this definition is especially helpful in our goal for dismantling institutional racism because it really points out that our, our work is not to identify and eliminate individual racists in our institutions, but really it is to begin to understand the complexity of how racism has been woven into the fabric of our society and how it is maintained by the policies and practices that, that our institutions operate in. Um, an important um, part of Crossroads' approach to, to dismantling institutional racism is to build a shared language with people in an institution for them to effectively talk about racism together in productive ways. Often we find people, when they're talking about racism, they're not always talking about the same thing and end up talking past one another in ways that become uh, uncomfortable and blaming and making people feel guilty. And that's not really effective to the work that we're trying to do. So just to lift up some of the ideas in the video, um, just to reiterate that, cross uh, that um, <laughs> racism is not the same thing as individual race prejudice and bigotry, that um, racism is socialized into every person in society. Nobody gets a pass from racism. Um, so racism is more than race prejudice. It's the collective action of a dominant racial group. And so it's racism, it's the systemic power that turns race prejudice into racism. And that it occurs when a dominant group imposes its beliefs, values, way of life um, onto, uh, onto subordinate groups in society. So again, here's the definition of racism that was um, introduced in the video, race prejudice plus the misuse of power by systems and institutions equals racism. Now you can see that this definition on this slide is slightly different than the one presented in the video. We've added, um, over the years, Crossroads has added the misuse of power by systems and institutions. And that really is to lift up that although racism, 
the way we understand it, is a problem of power. It's not power in and of itself that's the problem. It's the way that our systems and institutions misuse power to privilege white society and to disadvantage people of color communities. So I want you to think for just a minute about how would a definition like this, the power definition of racism, how would that be useful in your institution to help you and your colleagues talk about racism and begin to imagine ways that you could work together to dismantle racism? Some of the participants in, um, in our workshops have, have, um, have given some answers to this question, and there's some themes that I'd like to lift up from what they say. First of all, that the definition is a real relief, that their particularly white participants are really glad that it's not about, about blaming white people uh, for racism. Um, people comment on that it's good to know that it's, um, that it's, not, it's not an individual problem that they need to overcome. It's not about transforming hearts and minds. And it affirms our ability to work together as people of color and white people to, to eliminate um, institutional racism in our society. So some other things that participants say about the definition is that it helps them understand why racism is a barrier to their institutions being fully inclusive and prevents our institutions from fully living into our, um, our mission and purpose. It provides an opportunity to looking beyond the, the changing of individual hearts and minds. And it highlights how institutions are all connected to one another and how working in one institution will necessitate working in other institutions and across entire systems to dismantle uh, structural racism in our society. So that brings us to talking a little bit more specifically about the systemic nature of racism, that, um, that because the linking of all the institutions in our society, it's important for us to understand that dismantling racism in healthcare is really important in and of itself, but that racism didn't just, the healthcare disparities we have in the United States just didn't um, come about because of healthcare institutions alone. That health disparities in the United States in large part are, are a result of um, housing uh, segregation that happened um, long ago. But one of the ways that we can look at it is to look at, um, at the way that housing evolved in the 1940s. In the, video that I'm, in the video series that I mentioned previously by PBS, Unnatural Causes, they look, they use the community of Richmond here in the Bay Area to understand how housing segregation created health disparities in the community of Richmond. So they talk about um, at how at the end of World War II, with the, the onset of the GI Bill, white veterans in Richmond were able to get home loans, which allowed them to move out of Richmond and into the suburbs and to find better housing options for them and their families. Um, people of color, veterans of color, were not able to access the GI benefits in the same way, and so they ended up staying in communities like Richmond. And over time, the segregation increased, and um, uh, people of color, immigrants, and refugees, poor people of color, immigrants, and refugees also moved into, into Richmond, which created more complexity, more diversity, but also created more poverty. At the same time, public and private investment left Richmond, and so there wasn't the same kind of investment in housing and education and transportation and all the things that we understand as vital social infrastructure. Those investments were not being made in, in Richmond, they were being made in the suburbs and in other communities. So that left a crumbling um, infrastructure in Richmond and, um, and created a, a real cycle of decline, an economic cycle of decline. With the, um, with the location of the heavy industry and whatnot that's also in proximity to Richmond, really begin to see some real health impacts that are caused by the stress of poverty and the environmental stresses that industry brought. And so 
you, you can imagine that, that kind of stress then, what that does to the health of the people living in that community. And then combined with the microaggressions that people of color experience just in daily living in the United States, um, it really has some very problematic uh, results on people's health and wellness in, in communities like Richmond. So we like to talk about Crossroads. Um, at Crossroads, we like to talk about how diagnosis determines therapy. It's a term that we've borrowed from healthcare settings. That in order to really understand how to treat a problem, you really have to do some very careful diagnosis. And so one of the things that we do at Crossroads is to, sp is to we've developed a, a long workshop, a two and a half day workshop, that really is about diagnosing the problem of racism. We spend two and a half days really digging deep into racism in its individual, institutional, and cultural manifestations, and really unpacking that definition of racism, that power definition of racism, and understanding what its implications are for our lives. And we do, we spend that kind of time because we really do think that we don't have a full diagnosis of racism in our society, and that that has prevented us from finding uh, ways to eliminate it and, um, and to transform our institutions so that they are life-giving places for all of our constituents. So the things we talk about then in the Crossroads Understanding and Analyzing Racism Workshop is um, it's we do an, a very deep exploration of the historical roots of racism, um, how it came to be embedded in the fabric of the United States in its individual cultural and institutional manifestations. So also in the Understanding and Analyzing Racism Workshop, we talk about how racism negatively impacts all communities of color. It impacts um, each community of color differently, and it's important to understand the similarities and differences if we're gonna effectively dismantle racism. We also look at how racism privileges white society, how racism, uh, the power of racism to consolidate power and privilege uh, in, in white communities and white institutions. And then ultimately, and then we also want to look at how racism ultimately harms all of us, how we are all caught and dehumanized in this system of oppression. So that's a wrap up of the first session here, um, beginning to introduce uh, institutional racism. And in the next session, I'll talk about some s tools and skills needed for dismantling racism. So this is Rebette Diaz from Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training. I look forward to seeing you in the next session.